before the Lord. And only if you believe these words, let's say them together. This is my Bible. This is God's word speaking to me. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. It is the sword of the spirit, the word of God. With it, I wage war against the enemy of my soul. I will fight the good fight. I will contend for the faith. I will uphold the honor of God. In Jesus' name, amen. And if anybody asks you, yes, we did borrow that from Joel Osteen. Amen. We just changed a couple words. I remember being on vacation one time and watching uh, the television program, and that came on, and they made that confession. I said, I kind of like that. So we started making that confession not too long back, but I, but I love that little piece that the Lord put on my heart, that, that don't just say it to say it. Don't just say it just because it's time to say it. That if you have a Bible, and again, I would encourage you to, 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 to get a book, you know, I, I, and I know we have apps and all of that, and nothing is wrong with that, but, but there's something about a book, something about having it in your hand that, 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 that I don't have to plug this in. Uh, amen. I don't have to worry about, you know, pop-up ads. I don't have to worry about any of that. This, 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 this amazing tool that God has given us is something that, that, that even if we don't have it in our hands or, or, or on our laptop, David said, thy word have I hidden in my heart. Why? So that I might not sin against thee. So thank God for his word and thank God that we trust in the word that no matter what else goes on in our life, heaven, Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but the word of God will live on forever. So praise God. Listen, I told you already what, what, what the title of this, this, this message is, building a kingdom culture. And in a broad stroke, that's what I believe that God has been doing here for the past few years if you've been around for a while you will remember that once the Lord started really kind of downloading into my spirit the reality of the kingdom of God you know I've, I've been exposed to to different teachers read different books different di listened to different pastors who've talked about the kingdom and 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 that really has begun to resonate in my heart the the importance of understanding the kingdom of of God when Jesus came to the earth he preached the kingdom a unique message to a unique people Jesus said I have not come right now to any other people than to the lost sheep of Israel and so for three and a half years Jesus preached a very specific message the message Jesus preached was not primarily about salvation through him it was included in there and they would come to know that but the message that Jesus preached to that very specific people for a very specific time was about the kingdom of God and the reason why he preached that message to them is that as a nation, Israel was uniquely geared and qualified to hear this message. They knew about King David. They knew that God was going to establish his kingdom on earth and that David was one of the first to really begin that process of kingdom building and kingdom establishing. But then when David died, he passed it on to Solomon and we spent some time talking about how Solomon built this amazing temple. But the Bible also tells us that, that, that Jesus, as the son of David, the descendant of the lineage, the earthly lineage of the Davidic line, that he would one day return to the earth to take up his rightful place on the throne of David, his father, and that he will rule and reign on earth for what is called the millennial reign. That's a thousand years. Now, if this is all kind of Greek to you, then I would encourage you to go back and look at some of our, our recordings to pick up a few CDs and DVDs because the greatest event left to take place on the Christian calendar first is the return of Christ for the rapture of the church, the catching away 
of the saints. And don't let anybody tell you that the word rapture is not in the Bible. It's true, it's not. But the term catching away is that the Lord himself shall, you know, uh, that the Lord himself shall come with the shout, with the voice of the archangel and the, and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That is not talking about the second coming of Christ. That is talking about the return of Jesus to catch away the church. And once the church is caught up, then what will happen is a seven-year period called the tribulation. For some of you, this, this is a refresh, of course. For some of you, you are saying, Pastor, what are you talking about? There's a time coming called the tribulation. When the Antichrist, the exact opposite, the antithesis of everything that God stands for, will represent himself on earth as a, as, as a world leader, making great promises of peace and bringing about a type of peace for a period of about three and a half years. In the middle of that three and a half years, he drops the, the facade, starts to claim that he is God, demands to be worshipped. And if you've ever read the book of Revelation, that is where all of those judgments begin to take place. Where God pours out his wrath on a world that has rejected him. What we've been talking about in this place is the need for us to make sure that we are not falling prey to false teaching and false gospel. There is a false gospel, a ungodly narrative that is going out that is causing people to think that just be good enough, just try your best, just keep on keeping on, and somehow when the Lord returns, he's going to usher you into that place we call heaven. Can I tell you, that's not true. Because unless you bow your knee to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, unless you realize that your sins have separated between you and God and that there is an instantaneous gulf that you cannot cross called the chasm of sin, Jesus died to bridge that chasm and he said that he is the only way out of that dark place. That except, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life no man woman boy girl comes to me except the spirit draws him and no man can reach the father except I introduce you so Jesus is the only way not one of many ways not just a great teacher not just a wonderful philosopher Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords and so he is establishing amen he will establish an earthly reign for a thousand years but right now he is establishing his kingdom in us Jesus said to those people to whom he preached the kingdom he said that the kingdom is not going to come with a lot of fanfare because they were looking for you know this this great triumphal reign of a king like David and Jesus said no because my kingdom right now is in you so when we talk about a kingdom culture we are talking about a place within us where God is building his governmental structure in us I heard a pastor just put this put this out here recently that unless God reigns in you it's hard for him to reign over you because the kingdom that he's establishing is not just over us it's in us so that's where everything that God operates from and through happens. It's in that place within us where the kingdom of God is established. I think it's in Philippians or somewhere in the scripture where it says that we have an amazing treasure in an earthen vessel. That you and I are still made up of flesh and blood. You and I are still just simple human beings that one day, that while we were taken from the dust, we're going to return to the dust. But also within us, God has breathed something into your dust. God has breathed something into your finite physical being, and it is everything that he has. The fullness of God and the very kingdom of God and his power resides in you if you truly have submitted to Christ. So what we're learning is how to tap in to that. What we're learning is what is required of us to live in that place. That the one where the scripture says, greater is he that is in me than he that's in the world. Now that's a wonderful thing to know. But God does not just want that great thing to be in you. 
and you never experience it in your life because the kingdom has come and God wants his kingdom to be established where let thy kingdom come let thy will be done on earth so God is not just wanting you to die and go to heaven to experience kingdom he's trying to get the kingdom to the earth through us help me father God so listen I, so I just want to connect the dots of the past few messages and make sure that what I've been sharing is really planted in your spirits today using Solomon's temple as a guide we've been learning how to follow God's blueprint laid out in the scriptures to build ourselves into the spiritual houses of worship where he really dwells just like we were talking about let the church be the church and the church is us right so remember this people build buildings God builds people write that down on your refrigerator put that in your heart put it in in your wallet because there are a lot of church buildings that have no presence I hope that you know that this is because you erect a building and put a cross on it and call it a church doesn't automatically mean that God is obligated to show up just read pastor just read the apostle Paul says that that the church is God's household so this is God's house right we had this conversation I think at Metropolitan we said well you know the church is not the pastor well it, it's not but another pastor put it like this this is my church by stewardship it is your church by membership but it is God's church by ownership so we have to make sure that we realize that while this is my church and your church, this is God's church. Paul said that the church is God's household, the church of the living God, the pillar and the foundation of the truth. And we talked a lot about pillars. We talked a lot about the foundation. And again, I just want to connect some dots about how we got to that place. So I want to look back at a few key verses that I believe have set, set the stage. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And I want to start at verse 16. And if you re remember when we were here some time ago, I said that in that series, wherever we were, that when I read this, that what Paul is about to say to the Ephesian church has become my prayer for this church. So when Paul is talking about what he prays happened in that church thousands of years back, that is what I've been praying for this church thousands of years later. Y'all in Ephesians 1? Yes. Verse 16. Yes. Paul says, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I can't tell you how often I pray for friendship. How often I pray for the ministries of this house. How often I pray for the small groups. How often I pray for the leadership. How often I pray for the direction. How often I pray that I'm not the problem when it comes to God wanting to work in this place. I, I, I haven't said this in, in a while, but, but I believe it was Pastor Nick sometime asked me, some time ago asked me what, what I felt the biggest challenge in this church was. And before I could even think about it, the world rolled out of my mouth, I am. I am. Because oftentimes I, I, I want to make sure that I'm never in God's way. While at the same time, making sure that I'm in God's way. I don't want to be in his way, but I want to be in his way. I want to be where God wants me to be. And I have such a desire for this house that I don't want my desires to get ahead of his. That I've got such belief and such faith that what God wants to do, not just, again, not just in the building, but with the people, with everything that friendship has been through. With everything that we might be going through, with everything that might face us in the future, I believe that eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has entered into the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him in this place. But God is beginning to reveal those things to us by his spirit. First Ephesians chapter 1 verse 16. I have not give, stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation 
so that you might know him better. That's been my prayer, friendship. That everybody in this place, that as we grow, as we move on this journey of faith together, that we would all have the desire, first of all, to know God better. I know that there are some amazing men and women of God that you have dedicated your life to serving the Lord, that you read the Bible constantly, that God has blessed you and shown you great things. But I still believe that no matter how much you know about God, you can always know God better. Because one thing about the God I know is even once you've been in the way for a long time, God can show you a verse that you've read your whole life and one day you read it and go, oh, I never thought about it like that. Because God never shows you, because you can't see God in his infinite glory and live. So God shows you just enough of himself. He gives you just enough information. He gives you daily bread to sustain you in the moment, but then he gives you new bread tomorrow. How many of you know that the Bible says that the mercies of God are new every morning? God's got a blessing with your name on it, and, and can I tell you, God does not re-gift. I hope that nobody like I have got a gift from somebody that you gave them? Come on, you give somebody that gift. They say, oh, thank you, and then they put it away. And then a few years later, they forgot where it came from. And now it's your birthday. You say, oh, thank you, I gave this to you two years ago. But God is not like that. Every time, God gives you something new. God gives you something fresh. That's why God wants us to give him something new. That's why God says, sing it to the Lord, a new song. Come on. God wants to pour out new wine. God wants to pour out fresh oil. God wants to give you new blessings every morning. And my prayer for this house is that God will give you the spirit of wisdom. That's knowing how to use the information you already have. And revelation that God will continue to reveal himself to you in new ways. Why? So that you can know him better. Amen. Remember in the upper room, after Jesus had, had told the people that he was going to be betrayed, he got to a place, and it was the end of his life, and it's kind of strange that if you think about his life ending when he died, then you really don't understand the story. But in the upper room, Jesus said, listen, I'm now going to change the paradigm with you 11. Because Judas had left. God will, God, God will always dismiss the Judas spirits from your life before he takes you to your next level. <laughs> Judas had been hanging around, man, seeing all the miracles. Seeing all the glory. But it never quite soaked in. Judas had a mindset. That going in to meet Jesus, things were going to be a certain way. And as long as they met with Judas' expectation, he could hang around. He never changed because the Bible said he was a thief. Came in a thief, died a thief. But in the upper room, Judas had left and Jesus now said, listen, I need to change the paradigm. I'm no longer going to call you servants. Why? Because servants don't know their master's business. He said, but from now on, it's going to be a short window on this side. But I'm going to show you something greater on the next side. He said, but now I call you my friends. And you've heard me say this a few times. Friendship implies access. That you can have acquaintances that know about you. But you have a friend that knows you. And sometimes you need some friends that know you. So that you can be you. And not have them judge you. Because just because people know about you, you can't always be you because they don't know you. So they'll talk about you, but never to you. So write that down. Re record that. But friendship means, listen, I can, because you know me, I can be me. Sometimes you just need to learn how to be yourself. And Jesus said, listen, I've shown you all everything. I've shown you Somebody said, help me, Father God, in this moment. We always hear this verse that says God shares his glory with no man, right? 
But in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, what really is the Lord's Prayer, more than what we call the Lord's Prayer. What we call the Lord's Prayer is more the disciples' prayer, because that's what Jesus said, when you pray, pray like this. But John chapter 17, Jesus is praying, and he says something in this prayer. It's almost like a confession, because he knows that God said, I will not share my glory with anyone. But in John chapter 17, Jesus is praying, and he says, Father, the glory that you gave me, I gave them. Do you know that because of our relationship with the Lord and the one he wants to develop in us, that he wants to withhold nothing from you? But the question is, can he trust you with the information? Can he trust you with the glory that he wants to give you? And so Paul said, listen, I'm praying. That God will give us all the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. God wants to reveal to us all that he has a plan for you. Doesn't it say in Jeremiah 29, God says, I know, God says, I know the plans that I have for you. So God is a God who has plans. God is a God who gives plans. He always lays out a plan. And he tells you that if you'll just follow the plan, you'll be all right. Study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman, a person who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing, properly handling, being able to navigate the word of God so that everything that God has in store for you, he will give you. The first thing that God wants to give you is revelation. And we've talked about this, right? That that is what God's desire is to reveal himself to you so that you'll know him better. I don't know about you, but I want to know God better. I've seen God do incredible things. I've seen God do incredible things in my life. I've seen God do incredible things through my life. I've seen God do even greater things in spite of my life. Has anybody seen God do something in spite of you? That you did everything you could to mess it up. (laughs) Everything you possibly could. And God said, no, I'm going to bless you anyway. You're going to deal with some of the consequences of your foolishness. But I've got to use you in this moment. And that becomes when God begins to reveal himself to you. Watch this. Because a friend loves you even when you mess up. You know why the Bible says the righteous fall seven times? But the Lord picks him up every single time. Now, don't keep on falling. Don't don't assume or presume upon my friendship that if you keep falling, if you keep throwing up on my shoes, if you keep borrowing money, and I'm... that's called presumptuous sins. That's when we reach a place in our lives where we ask God to forgive us before we even do it. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. Verse 18, I pray. Again, this is my prayer for friendship. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened. In order that you might know, that you might know some things, that as God has revealed some things to you, that you'll finally know some things, that you will know, number one, the hope to which he has called you. Hope is not a, an empty expectation of an unsure future. I have a hope, not like I hope and wish, but I have an earnest expectation that what God says is going to happen. And so my hope is based on God's promise. But until I see that promise, I hold on to my hope. It's not a wish. It's an earnest expectation of an established future. When God says it is a predestination, when I get on a plane to Hawaii, whenever that happens, it says on my ticket where I'm going. I'm still in the airport in L.A., but I'm going to Hawaii. Now, I hope that the ride is smooth. I hope that the peanuts are fresh. Come on, somebody. I've got some hope, but I've got an expectation that when this rascal lands his plane, I'm not going to end up in Guatemala as much as I might want to go to Guatemala. I'm going to Gatlinburg in Hawaii, and I have an expectation, right? Because I believe that God is doing it. So this expectation is our hope. That God wants you to wake up to the hope that he has placed in you. The hope to which he has called you. The riches of his glorious inheritance where? 
in his people. Can I tell you again, and I don't want to preach this stuff because I've already preached it. The inheritance of God is not all in heaven. Isn't that what it says? That God wants to wake you up to the inheritance that he has in his people. There is an inheritance that resides in us. There's an inheritance that he is holding off for us when we reach that place of glory. But in the meantime, I've got access to that heavenly account right now. Stop walking through life like you're broke. Stop walking through the life like a beggar. Stop walking through life like the world owes you something. God has already given you everything. You just need to learn how to access it. All of my needs are met in him. God wants you to wake up to the inheritance that he has in his holy people and his incomparably. I could preach this, but I'm not. I've got to constrain myself on this point. Incomparably great. What's incomparably mean? There's no comparison. So nuclear power, solar power, horsepower, incom there, there, there is no power to compare with the incomparably great power that's available for us that believe. So if we've got incomparably great power, why oftentimes do Christians seem so worried when a problem arises? incomparably great power when the doctor gives you that mean diagnosis incomparably great power when people that you've trusted walk out of your life when they tell you that they're closing that part of the division that you have spent your whole life in when they tell you that we're gonna lay you off but you haven't been here long enough to get your pension. Incomparably great power for us that believe. See, sometimes we don't wake up to this need until we need it. I have this thing, this philosophy that I've developed since I was in high school. It has more to do with, I used to always carry a jacket even on warm days. Because I had this philosophy that was developing. It is better... To have and not need than to need and not have. See, you don't need your spare tire until you need it. And it's a terrible thing to need and not have. So sometimes in our lives we run into problems and we look for God's power. We look for answers. We look for deliverance. And in that moment, we need something that we don't have. We have to call emergency roadside assistance. We have to say, dear Jesus, help me out one more time. Because I find myself on the road of life. And Lord, my prayer life is not inflated. My faith is not. My, my, my faith tank is running on E. And when I should have been built up, when I should have been growing in the things of God, when the problems come, now the problem is really a problem because I don't have an answer for it. Come on, God wants you to stop living your life dealing with problems when they happen. God wants you to stop dealing with problems when they happen and have the strength to overcome them before they happen. Come on, no weapon formed against me shall prosper now. Because I'm sharpening my axe. I'm sharpening my sword. I'm in my prayer closet. I'm reading the, the word of God while it's sunny. Because I know that somewhere over the rainbow, Satan is waiting on me to mess up. Licking his chops. I know he's going to mess up because he does it on the regular. But I hide God's word in my heart. Help me, Father God. Man, I'm trying to finish this, this thing, but I hope it's good to you because it's good to me. Amen. Incomparable great power for us to believe. That power is the same as his mighty strength he exerted when he raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand. Far above all, watch this. He seated him far above all rule and authority, power and dominion and every name that is invoked, not only in his present age, but also in the age to come. Here it comes, verse 22. And God placed all things under his feet. And appointed him 
to be the head over everything for who? Who's the church? For us. So I'm glad somebody said I am. See, over the head of church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. Listen, if Jesus is the head of the church and God has put everything under his feet and we are his body, where then should the problems of our life be? Under his feet. But I'm part of his body. So as long as I'm walking with him, I need to realize that in the spirit, those things are already under my feet. In reality, I'm still going to have to struggle. In this life, I'm still going to have to cry. In this life, I'm still going to have to hurt. In this life, I'm still going to have to learn, lose some things. But, but the Bible says that God has put everything under his feet. So what I need to start doing is stop walking in my own strength and walk in his strength. I need to stop walking on my own two feet and start learning how to walk on his own two feet. Can I tell you that it is God's purpose for you to walk over every circumstance in his name? That's why Jesus said that if you would just operate in my name, stop worrying about your strength because you ain't got none. Stop worrying about your goodness. You ain't got none. I'm sorry for God. You don't have any. Sometimes I forget where I am. Because if I was on the other side of town, I could say, ain't got none. And y'all just say, amen. But we're, you know, on this side. Don't have any. Sometimes you just got to get down. Ain't got none. Satan, Satan, Satan ain't got no hold on you. Stop letting, him, stop letting the devil tell you that he's got authority in your life. Just because you hurt, don't give him no authority. Just because you're suffering, don't give him no authority. The authority is in Christ. What I need to do is I need to retreat to my safe place. Sometimes I get in front of the Lord because I think I'm all that. God has blessed me. Remember when the 70 came back and they said, oh, Jesus, even the demons obeyed us and Jesus said watch out now because that's where you get in trouble is when you see a few victories sometimes you forget where they come from when you have a few breakthroughs you start looking at your prayer life you start looking at your study of the word of God I am more than a conqueror yeah but you're a conqueror through him I need to lay it at the feet of Jesus. But watch what he says. He says that God wants us. The revelation is that God wants, you to, God wants you to understand that he wants you at a place where you literally, everything that comes against you, put it under your feet. Don't let it rise up in your life. Put that problem in your home. Put it under your feet. Don't look at it with your natural eye because it's not going to change today. But it, watch this. Because it's not, never, it may never change in the natural. Because things many times change in the spirit before they change in, in the natural. That's why we call those things that be not in the natural as though they were. Why? Because I'm not speaking to the way things look. I'm speaking to the way God says they're supposed to be. God wants you to learn how to speak his word into your circumstances. So that those things that had dominion over you, you'll realize I can walk over them. Come on, that's who I am in Christ. That the revelation of God, why? That the spirit of revelation and wisdom might come so you might know God better. See, listen, my relationship with God needs to be so tight that I know he'll never let me fall. Not that he'll never let me go through anything, but that he'll be with me. And lo, I am with you no matter where you go. So the first thing that we talked about was revelation. But once you have revelation, you need to learn implementation. See, because once God shows you something, that's wonderful. But God just doesn't want you to know something to know it. He wants you to know something so that you can do something with it. Come on, you lifelong students, you know a lot of things. What are you doing with it? I had an aunt that I believe she had, like, was just a, 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 a lifelong student. Always in class. Always, you know, getting masters and PhDs and doing all this stuff. But she was always in school. That, that's what, a career student. And nothing wrong with that. But, like, what are you doing with all this information? How many church folks are career students who never graduate to the real world? Always learning. Isn't that what Paul said? Is that there will come a time when people be ever learning? 
Always learning. I need another sermon. I need another CD. I need another message. I need another preacher. I need another church. I need another experience. I need, I need, I need, I need. When are you going to do something with what you have? Somebody put, you know, some folks, some folks, some folks have said about certain preachers in certain places that I'm not being fed. Awesome, awesome. Sometimes, listen, it's not what you're being fed. It's that you don't like what's on the menu. Come on, somebody. See, listen, when you go to Cheesecake Factory, you got choices. Should I come back for your order? Yeah, because I'm still on page seven and don't know what I'm ordering. But some of put it like this, at mama's house, you got two choices. Take it or leave it. Go to, go to chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 6. And I'm only saying 6, 6, and 7 so that you'll know something. That when God raised up Jesus, Jesus raised us up too. Stop trying to make it to heaven. Please stop trying to make it, make it to heaven. If you were raised with Christ when you got saved, you need to realize that Jesus already gave you a seat in a heavenly place. That in the spirit, you are already at the table. Verse 6 says, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to Jesus Christ. Drop down to verse 19. Consequently, since that's true, you're no longer foreigners. You're no longer strangers. You're no longer sinners. I know this always gets me in trouble when I say this, that if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, by nature, you are no longer a sinner. You have the capacity now. You still have the capacity. But if any man, woman be in Christ, they are a new creature. Old things have. Behold, all things Become new. In Christ, you are new. In you, you're the same. So there's that conundrum. There's that constant battle between who I am in Christ and who I am in me. Reverend Marvin T. Robinson said one of the most profound things I've ever heard, and I say this of myself. I have no problem with Pastor Lucia Smith. Pastor Lucia Smith is one of the holiest, most dedicated child of God you're ever going to find. I know the scripture. I know how to pray. I know how to encourage people. My biggest problem is Lucius. Lucius still want to be Lucius. Still want to. Go where he goes. Still want to. See, folks used to say, you were a bad little boy in church. No, that was impossible. Not in this church. Not back then. Uh Uh-uh. Now with all them church mothers, that had permission to whoop your behind and then tell your parents. So when people say that I was bad, no, no, no. I was, I was outgoing. (laughs) Whatever. But I'm no longer a foreigner. I know that. I'm no longer a stranger. I'm a fellow citizen with God's people and also members of his household. Built on the foundation, there's that word again, of the apostles and the prophets, and Christ Jesus himself being the chief, corn, the chief cornerstone. In him, here's where we went on last week, in him, the whole building, joined together, rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too, say me too, in him, you too are being built. You are still under construction. Child of God, you are still under construction. That if God is at work in you, God is still building. So what is he building? He's building his kingdom. He's building a place where he can dwell. He's building a house in which his glory can manifest itself. He said you are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Again, people build buildings. God builds people. What did we say on last week? And I'm going to try to paraphrase this just to wind this down because i got two more points, but I believe I've saturated your mind enough. What did we learn on last week? 1 Corinthians 3. No other foundation can be laid except the one that's already laid, and that's Jesus, right? Isn't, that's what Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, whoever hears these sayings of mine, all of them, not just what he said in chapter 5, 6, and 7, but everything that Jesus, he said, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not, 
Put them into practice. In other words, you hear an amazing sermon, come out of an amazing service with awesome worship, power of God moving, but you don't take it and apply it to your life. See, all of us are building something every day. You're building your career. You're building your future. You're building your reputation. And Jesus said that if you are not using the right kind of building materials, I'm not saying that you're not saved. We're talking about foundational principles. He said no foundation can be laid except the one that's already laid. Now, be careful how you build. That's why Jesus said, if you take these sayings of mine, it's the house that you're building. And I said this on last, last week, and I'm going to stand by it until the Lord says otherwise. God is not going to build your house. He just gives you a foundation and offers you material. I know this is, listen. This is not something you can go and like find a verse on, but I believe that the scripture will support this. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, he said, no foundation can be laid except the one that's laid. Now, be careful how you build. Because you've got different types of building material. You've got gold, silver, precious stones, and you've got wood, hay, and straw or stubble. Deacon Williams and I had this conversation on last week. There's a King James word in another part of the scripture. It says that in a house, there are different types of vessels. Some for noble use, some for ignoble. King James word. Something that is vile and basic and common. And The scripture said that if we will separate ourselves from the common things, then God will use us for greater things. Remember what Paul said on last week when we were talking about in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, again, that when we have divisions, not opinions, because we all have opinions, but when those opinions divide us, when our political affiliations divide us, I'm going to say this now and hammer this thing home, and I hope every YouTube channel and everything says it. The body of Christ is being divided like no other time on earth because of this political nonsense going on. Because it's the church folks talking that talk, using those words. That's not my president. I prefer that president. And have an opinion, but don't be belittle other believers who are of a different mindset because the de- that's what Satan wants to do and churches families Christian households are divided and a house divided cannot stand can I tell you that I believe that's exactly what Satan wants that's exactly what he's been after is that the only legitimate agency on earth that can bring peace and hope to the world, we're turning on each other. And Satan, watch this. Once Satan starts a plan, and now he's got you bought into it, he don't have to do nothing. But step step back and watch it kill yourselves. Can I tell you, that's why God is calling us back to the kingdom. And in this place, we're going to use these three materials. I'm going to wind this up right here. Gold, silver, and precious stones are not things that are common. You've got to dig for those. You've got to search for those. You have to be willing to pay the price for those. That's why Jesus said that the kingdom of God is like treasure hidden in a field. Salvation is free. The kingdom you've got to dig for. You just can't come to church and the kingdom just drop in your lap. You've got to move some stuff out of your life. You've got to get past the ignoble things of the wood, hand, straw, the common things. And build your hope on Jesus, yes, but build your temple to the Lord on spiritual things. In spite of what people do to me, I'm still going to do unto them the way I would have them do unto me. When they strike me on one cheek, I'm still going to turn the other cheek. When they cuss out my mama, I got to pray on that one. but I'm still going to pray for them 
that despitefully use me. That's why Jesus said, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye. That's how the world operates. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those that disagree with you. Don't let your light be put out by anyone. Don't let your salt, don't let your flavor be diminished by a world that demands you walk and talk and act like them. I'm peculiar from birth. I'm, watch this, spiritually, I'm just weird like that. And when it comes to my walk with God, that's how God made me. I'm peculiar. I'm not supposed to. I, I love when I have these internal conversations and y'all wondering if I'm having a fit or about to faint. I was not made to fit in. I was made to stand out. Come on, somebody. God didn't make you to fit in with, with, with the world. God made you like that. Kingdom citizen. Where I'm from, this is how we walk. Where I'm from, this is how we talk. Where I'm from, this is the power that's in my... Do with me as you will because you can't do nothing to the real me. Because greater is he that is in me. If I could throw something right now, I would. (laughs) Then he that's in the world. Can you bless the Lord in this place? (laughs) Woo, my God. building what are we building a culture attitude feeling a vibe in this place the kingdom of God Jesus said that the kingdom suffers violence King James says that the violent take it by force more modern translations like the NIV said that the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing and forceful people press their way into it God is not looking for the timid, not in days like this. Paul told Timothy, God didn't give you no spirit of fear. God didn't give you the spirit of timidity. He gave you the spirit of power. Why? Power to deal with the world. He gave you the spirit of love. Why? Because love is in such great demand, real love. Not this carnal, if you love me, you'll do what I want. Not that. And self-control or sound mind. I need today, as a gift of the Spirit, I need more self-control. It's a gift. It's a gift that God gives. Not just because I'm running roughshod, but sometimes people just... Sometimes people just say stupid stuff. No, no, not hurtful. Hurtful, yeah, but just, and I'm sorry if this offends folks, but you know who I'm talking about. You know those people in your life, you know, Keith, Keith, Keith and I had this conversation. Like, like sometimes somebody will say something to you and you'll look at them like, are you pulling my leg or are you really that stupid? Because there's so many people that just have opinions based on no facts. Don't, don't need facts. Don't mess up my conversation with facts. <laughs> had an interaction with somebody on a, a Bible question last night on Facebook, and I rarely get into these because I know where it's going. And I kept quoting scripture to this person who had this opinion and they kept giving me these philosophical answers well well what is this and if this is true what is that I said okay all of that's great bro what does the word of God say and sometimes there are people today there are bishops apostles pastors who who will tell you about the word but won't tell you the word And so what that means is that the word, it's debatable. We can arrive at different opinions, different conclusions. If we use these various formulae to come to our places of belief, 
God said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. I wonder what that means. <laughs> what does the Greek say? What does the Aramaic terms mean in the time in which Jesus spoke? What does it say? There is only one way, only one, to the Father, and that's Jesus. And once you enter that, you enter a dimension of truth, a whole realm of kingdom reality that you don't have to wait for to get to heaven. God wants to download that into your spirit. But you know, sometimes, even in the real world, that your bandwidth can't handle the information stream. And so you get this little circle. It's buffering. It's trying to wait for an open channel. It's waiting for an open channel to give you information that is readily available. But you're clogged with all this other stuff. God wants us to clear our bandwidth. I sound like I know what I'm talking about, right? I, I can't even hook up the router at my house. But I've read somewhere these things. God wants to clean up some bandwidth because we got too much static. Too much information coming in to clog the information that's readily available. Friendship Pasadena, my prayer for you is that God will give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation just so we can know him better. That the eyes of our understanding might suddenly open so that we might know three simple things. The hope to which he has already called us the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints, not just in heaven, but in us, and incomparably great power. But you know what? It all comes one way. That if you will confess with your mouth, first of all, Jesus Christ is Lord. That means he rules everything. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead right here, right now. God can transfer your residence from separate in darkness to seated with him in heavenly places right now. It can happen just that fast. But it comes by saying yes to Jesus. If you haven't done that today, let me urge you, make that decision. There's no guarantee that you'll see tomorrow. There's no guarantee that you'll have another chance. This is your chance. In the day you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. This might be all that you get. Some of you have heard this and you started, but you got away from God. The Bible calls you a backslider. God is married to the backslider. You haven't lost relationship. You've just lost fellowship. You've gotten out there like the prodigal son. Still loved by the father, but you're in a pig pen in relationship to where God wants you to be. He just said, just come to yourself. Come back home. He'll wash you, cleanse you, give you the robe, the ring, the sandals. Restore you today. That can happen right here and right now. Don't have a church home? You're already here. Why not, why not join? Why not say, I want to be a part of this work in progress? We've still got some signs under construction. We're not there yet, but we're on our way. And I believe this would be an awesome time for you to make a decision for Jesus. Want to get saved today? Get saved. Want to come back to God? Make that happen. Want to become a part of this church family? Right here, right now. As we stand to our feet, if God is speaking to your heart, won't you come? Come on, come to Jesus for the first time. Come back to Jesus for the second time. Become a part of the church family, perhaps for the only time. Have your way.